Okay, so this is lecture 25 on the Frechet derivative and the linearization of maps. So the basic problem here is to ask the question, well, what is the derivative for functions um, that have both a vector input and a vector output? Like, how do we understand differentiation in that context? Um, you know, for a function, we could associate with a function from R to R, the derivative function also, well, also a function. And, um, you know, one is tempted to think, so, okay, so if we're talking about a, a mapping from Rn to Rm, then the derivative should likewise be a mapping from Rn to Rm. And, um, well, it's just rarely ever the case that you can do that. Um, and so let's, let's try to understand why that is. All right. So first of all, think about this. The derivative is defined by difference quotient, right? So that fails to generalize directly. Why? Well, a couple of reasons come off, come, you know, come to mind right away. Number one, we can't, if, well, you know, h is in the domain of the function, right? So if, if the domain of the function is vectors, well, we can't divide by a vector, so we can't just do this formula again, right, for one thing. And then the other thing is, well, the whole idea of the derivative was really wrapped up in the limit of the secant line becoming a tangent line, right? And if you start thinking about, like, what does it geometrically mean, the analog of the tangent line for mappings from Rn to Rm, well, it's, it's more complicated than just an object of the same type, all right? Um, well, usually. There are some exceptions. Um, I mean, fine. If, if, you're, if your domain is one-dimensional, and um, you know your 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 range is, is higher dimensional. That's okay. That's a space curve. That's that's a parametrized curve. We we talked about that in, in your calculus three course. And uh, you know there the derivative is captured by the velocity. And, and, and okay, they're 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 fine. We can still do the limiting. Essentially, the generalization um, works there. We can still just define derivative in terms of the difference quotient for that case. But setting that aside, it's usually weirder, right? Like, even when the range is one-dimensional, we need something like a gradient of f to capture the tangent space. Um, all right, so let's see here. So something something has to give, right? We, have to, we need a better definition for uh, the derivative in general. And this is um, sort of the natural thing to do. Um, at least a lot of people <laughs> think this is the natural thing to do. Um, like, I don't know, a couple hundred calculus books, something like that. Probably more. <clears throat> uh, so this is right here. This is the so-called Frechet quotient. Um, and so the analog of the derivative is essentially this L of H. I, I, I tell you that that L of H is equal to DFA of H. And that's called the differential, um, differential of f at a. So the differential of f at a is sort of the analog of the derivative. Um, now in Edwards, he says that the matrix of the differential is the derivative. I don't, I don't use that language universally. Um, it's, it's cute, it's nice, but... Um, I say that the matrix of the differential is the Jacobian matrix, and I just don't say that something is the derivative here. Uh, I, I just, I don't do that. Um, uh, so anyway, um, so here's the, here's the definition. If you can find a linear transformation such that f of a plus h minus f of a minus l of h, all divided by the norm of h, um, is equal to zero as h goes to zero, then the function is said to be differentiable at a, and this L of h is called the differential of a. All right. And we define the Jacobian to be the standard matrix of that differential at a. And that's it. That's the definition. So you have a problem in your homework. I asked you to show that differentiable implies continuous, so you, you'd like to show that um, this implies continuous, and what would continuous mean in this context? Continuous in this context would mean showing that the limit as h goes to zero of, like for our purposes here, continuous should mean that the limit 
as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h is equal to f of a. If you can show that, that would demonstrate continuity of f at a. All right. So, and you should be able to get that um, from this or something like that. All right, anyway, um, moving on here. So, theorem. Let's talk about this some more. We talk about the connection between the Jacobian matrix and the differential, all right? They're, they're related, um, but there's some subtle points connecting them. Um, first of all, though, if it's differentiable, then the Jacobian exists, of course, but more than that, its columns are given by partial derivatives of the function with respect to the variables in the domain, evaluated at the point in question, of course. Um, so let me try to elaborate on, on why that is. So if it's differentiable, if the function's differentiable at A, then you have this, you know, wonderful, complicated, uh, multi-dimensional Fréchet quotient being equal to zero, that limits to zero, you know? And so if the multivariate limit exists, then, then it means all path limits likewise converge to zero, right? So you can consider a path along the i-th coordinate direction approaching the origin. T goes to TEI. Um, then if we set h equal to TEI in the above, then we get the limit as t goes to zero of like the absolute value of t of this, this stuff right here, right? But then, um, let's see here, but then from t positive, you can drop the absolute value and you just got the difference quotient um, f of a plus t i minus f of a over t and the t pulls out and these t's cancel, right? And it follows then that the limit of this difference quotient is equal to dfa of ei, which is exactly column, the ith column of um, the standard matrix. In, in other words, this is the ith column of the Jacobian matrix of f at a, right? And um, but this is nothing more than the partial derivative of f with respect to the ith coordinate, because what you're doing with this formula is, is you're freezing all the coordinates except for the ith one where you're varying it, all right? Um, I, okay, fine, this is half of the, half of the partial derivative, because we also need the limit as t approaches zero from the left, but that also is, you can obtain from this. <clears throat> okay, the absolute value of t gets a minus but that's okay, because this is equal to zero, so you can throw away the minus and you still get this result on the other side. And so there you go, that's this theorem, that if the Jacobian exists, its columns are partial derivatives. That's pretty straightforward. The other direction, though, is more subtle. The other direction is, is, is considerably more subtle. If the function from R to M to R M has partial derivatives, which exist and continuously so, right, near a point, then F is differentiable at points where the Jacobian of F exists. Um, and I, so to state this sort of more in terms of terminology, what this theorem is saying is that continuous differentiability at A implies differentiability at A. Continuous differentiability is a statement about the continuity of partial derivatives of the function. Differentiability is a statement about that multivariate limit. So continuous differentiability rests on, you know, um, component derivatives, whereas this is everything together. Proof is in Edwards. It is somewhat involved. You can see page 72 if you want to look at it. Um, I have proved that in previous years of my Math 332 course. If you really want me to, if you want to see me do it, I can try to find it. It's there somewhere on the on the YouTube. Um, it takes it takes a while to prove that properly, but um, there's more I can say here. By the way, the assignment A maps to the differential of A. If you think about it, is a map from R n to linear maps. It's the assignment of a linear map for each input. So like, 
How would you discuss continuity of that assignment directly? I, I mean, we wouldn't do that. We haven't defined what that means, that kind of continuity. Because we haven't explained, you know, the operator norm. Um, so it can be described via the operator norm. And um, when you sort through all of it, you'll be pleased to learn that continuous differentiability at A means that the assignment A maps to the differential of A is continuous. And um, again, that's above our pay grade here, but if you want to see it, it's in, in Edwards, Proposition 2.4, page 176. This, this terminology of continuously differentiable does in fact imply continuity of the derivative in the abstract sense of um, point maps to operator. So this is something we can talk about in lower level calculus because students understand partial derivatives. This is something that, you know, um, there's a smaller audience that's ready to understand what operator norm means, but anyway. I think actually more people could understand it if they believe they could, but that's an argument for another day. Um, so practical interpretation. If you have a function, differentiable at A, then you can replace the function by its linearization. Um, which we could look at in a couple of different ways. One is like this. So we, you know, take the value plus the Jacobian at the value times x minus a, or if we want to look at it at the point shifted by h, it's the value at a plus the Jacobian of f times h. So you could think about, you know, this is, this, this, the second formula comes from the first with x equal to a plus h, so the a's cancel. I mean, however you want to look at it. Um, I'll just admit that I'm a little bit ambiguous in what I mean by linearization, because I either mean this or I mean that. Um, all right, anyway. So we use the Jacobi matrix to find the best linear approximation to the generally curved quote-unquote function. Here's an example. An actual example, well, you know. <laughs> so I've got a function of xy is equal to the square root of... Um, x1 plus x2 plus y squared, and um, so f of 2, 2 is 3, and the Jacobian of f is this, which means that my Jacobian is actually a row vector, 2 thirds, 2 thirds, and here it is. So this is the uh, good approximation to the function near 2, 2, and just to see, to check on it, you know, if I plug in 1, 0, um, I get 11 thirds, Right, one zero would be like what? Um, well, LF of one zero in my current notation would be L of, uh, I'm approximating F of uh, three, three halves, which is an approximation to the square root of 14. So the approximation gives me 3.66 repeating. The actual square root of 14 is more like 3.74. Yeah, it's not too shabby. Now, admittedly, this is something I could have done in calculus three because the, dom the, the you know, it, it's, from R2 to R, so like, okay, this isn't really new. I, fine, you got me. I think next page I've got something that's a little bit more um, out there. Although I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit bothered um, for the sake of notational consistency that I've used two different things to mean linearization. So here is the linearization, for example, one. In the XY notation, it would look like this instead. All right, and, and, and fine, fine. I shouldn't use the linearization notation for both. I need to pick one or the other. And I'm just not gonna do that, so my apologies. Um, I, I usually will say something like, when I ask you to calculate it, like find the linearization x, y, or find the linearization of, I usually say something in the problem statement, which will let you know which linearization I'm looking for. But. Listen, you give me either one, I'm going to give you full credit, probably. So, anyway, here's another one. Here's a function from R3 to R3, like so. You calculate the Jacobian, it's that 3 by 3 matrix. I decided I wanted to find linearization at 1, 2, 3. So I plug in 1, 2, 3 into the Jacobian, it gives me this. I calculate f of 1, 2, 3, it gives me that. And here's my difference factors, x minus 1, y minus 2, z minus 3. Again, that's all because I'm doing it at one, two, three. And so there you go. That's the linearization of this function at one, two, three. Just like that. And um, 
So I've given the definition, by the way, for uh, the Fourier derivative for maps from Rn to Rm, but in fact this definition easily extends to norm linear spaces, like n by n matrices, where the norm is given by this. And um, anyway, I have more to say about that in my 332 notes if you're interested. So anyway, next up, of course, is a little bit on intuition for the inverse function theorem.